All right, so um, let me transition now to the panel on challenges and opportunities of transparency in COVID-19 research. We're really delighted to have uh, a really exciting panel. There's Kerry Wolinetz from NIH here, Samir Bhatt from uh, Imperial College London, uh, Joachim Weil from UC Davis, and the panel will be moderated by um, Maya Peterson, who's a just really treasured colleague uh, of ours here uh, at Berkeley, who's long participated in BITS um, events. Uh, Maya is a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics here at Berkeley. She's the chair of the division of biostatistics. Uh, she's done pioneering work on causal inference uh, and research transparency, and she's leading several important studies right now on COVID-19 spread. So she's just the perfect person to, to lead this panel, and we're just delighted to have her here. So welcome, Maya. Thanks so much, Ted, for that great introduction. And it's wonderful to see all these faces. Um, it's really an honor to uh, have the chance to moderate this fantastic panel. And uh, let's just dive right in. So in terms of format for the next hour, um, we're going to start off by hearing uh, a little some words and perspective from each of our three panelists. And then we'll have about half an hour of moderated discussion between them. Um, and then we're going to make sure to leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end and for Q&A from the audience. So if you have questions that come up during the next hour, uh, feel free to type them into the chat and we will spend some time discussing them at the end. Uh, so without, uh, without any further ado, it's an honor to introduce our first panelist, uh, Samir Bhatt, who's Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College London. Uh, Samir has led several epidemiologic studies of COVID-19 with the MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis. Um, which uh, in particular has adopted a policy of rapid and open sharing. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Samir, um, for some opening thoughts on open science, open science practices in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks all. So, uh, you know, when this pandemic first kicked off, it exposed a lot of the deficiencies that were there within the field of epidemiology. Um, for those that cross cut in into statistics and machine learning, there really has been a lot of good practice in those fields in terms of reproducing code, in terms of releasing data, in terms of bringing researchers to modern tools, I call them modern, even though they're quite old things like GitHub um, and, and other resources online. And while some epidemiologists generally did use these, it, it, it was quite poor. If you, if you went and looked at a seminal piece of epidemiological work, um, you would have found uh, it not as easy as you hoped to reproduce their code. You would have to probably reverse engineer it yourself or code it up yourself for the mathematics written there. You probably would have asked to ask the authors for their data. Um, and it would have written on the paper saying, you know, data available on request from authors. And they probably would have given you a runaround because they wanted to use it themselves. And this really slows down science and creates an, an undemocratic um, distribution of science and data. If you've, if you've published your paper, people should cite it, but you don't necessarily have to hoard the data or make the code difficultly available so people have, have time to reproduce their code. Um, and so there is a negative side to that, that um, you know, code and, and data should be completely made available. In epidemiology, this would help low and middle income settings and low and middle income countries or researchers from unprivileged institutions to, to, to further, you know, be able to access and, and perform, you know, top world-class science built on the shoulders of giants. Now, of course, the cost with this is, and because there always is a cost with this, is that when someone releases all their code and releases all their data, necessarily it makes their research entirely transparent and therefore as scientists we have a responsibility to further the science in a um, respectful fashion you know having disagreements but not necessarily vitriolic chants online and so in a sense you know when when bug no science is ever correct and so this this acceptance needs to happen and especially when we get full transparency and we can see that no science is ever correct each is an incremental stepping stone in itself. Um, and I think this is an important, th these two uh, parts are important to balance with each other. And so I'm happy to see epidemiology moving more into 
the 21st century with the, with the kind of tools available. At Imperial College, we've tried to do this, um, as we'll talk about with the panel later. Um, you know, we, we're trying to embrace new innovative tools, such as the wonderful uh, initiative called Code Check, done by Stephen Eglin at the University of Cambridge, which reproduces code, provides a certificate showing that it's reproducible. And, and then, you know, that's a very good contribution to the literature. So that's just a, a brief ramble from my viewpoint. Um, I think I'll hand it off to, to one of the other, other panelists to, to, to ramble away as well, and then I'll join in. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for those. That's Samir. Um, so next, let's hear a brief introduction from uh, Joachim or Joe Weil, who's a PhD candidate of Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Davis. Um, and he has assessed the credibility of research on the effectiveness of mobility restriction policies using open practices, um, has also been using secondary open data to study social distancing. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you, Maya, and thanks a lot to the organizers. I'm very humbled to be here with uh, so many amazing scientists. Um, I thought I could talk a bit about my own experience with open science as I'm trying to implement transparency practices uh, and also to assess the robustness of the statistical methods that we use as uh, applied economics. Um, so at the onset of the pandemic, uh, one of the major questions was, and very much still is, whether the non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as uh, social distancing orders, actually work to limit the spread uh, of COVID. And of course, this directly depends uh, on whether these um, um, uh, mobility restricting measures work to reduce the mobility of people. And so this is what we started to look into with uh, my co-authors uh, back in March. And to answer this question, well, we crucially need to have access to some mobility data. And there are in fact several companies that track our whereabouts through uh, smartphone pings. And one of the first company uh, that started to make some data available was Google. They provided very aggregated measures of mobility at the county level um, for many different countries. But it, that was not great at all because they actually only provided this data in uh, the form of graphs that were embedded in PDFs. And this made it really difficult to work uh, with this data and not great at all for data analysis. And for some reason, they didn't want to share uh, CSV files when we asked them, but this was really short-sighted because uh, all of a sudden you had a very quick community of researchers who organized on GitHub and well, they started to uh, share code to extract the data from the figures in the PDF. And so after a few weeks, basically the CSV files were available and a lot of researchers were working from them. And of course, at this point, uh, Google made their data available as CSV files. Um, the problem is that we also realized that uh, this data was uh, not great because it was missing many dif uh, different areas in the US especially areas with low, um, uh, with, uh, 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 low income, so more disadvantaged areas. And so uh, what really helped then is that there was another private company called SafeGraph that started to organize a network of thousands of researchers and that started to share a large amount of very detailed but still anonymous mobile phone uh, data for free. And this was a huge deal for uh, open science because these data are usually super expensive. They can cost uh, thousands of dollars. And so many researchers can't afford to pay for them, uh, let alone grad students. Um, and people at, at SafeGraph were really proactive. They started to organize a large network to improve the quali uh, quality of the data, to organize uh, and share the findings and to in, uh, improve the accessibility of these data. Um, and for instance, uh, Nick Huntington Klein, who I think is presenting tomorrow, created an entire R package to work with this data. Um, so I know it sounds a bit like I'm advertising for SafeGraph, but I, I did not expect a private entity to step up and to organize a network that quickly. So to me, this certainly counts as one of the big successes of uh, uh, early response during the pandemic. And since then, other companies have done the same. For instance, uh, Facebook, who's working with the uh, the Carnegie Mellon uh, researchers. Yeah, so we used this data uh, and found that uh, social distancing was occurring across the board, but that most of the social distancing was 
actually occurring in wealthier areas, uh, which raise concern because this means that uh, poor individuals might be at increased risk of, um, of infection. Um, again, so now comes the bad news. Um, as we were performing the analysis, we realized something pretty weird that in many cases, it looked as, as if people in the US were reducing their mobility well before the social distancing orders were enacted. So this is what economists call pre-trends in differences in differences. And this is problematic because uh, when there are pre-trends, this typically invalidates the interpretation of our statistical estimates. If people stay at home before the policy orders uh, are enacted, then it's hard to attribute the reductions in mobility to the NPIs, so to the, uh, to the public health measures. Um, so for the past six months, we've been trying to figure out where these pre-trends came from. And as we were pondering on this issue, there were like many papers coming out where all the results looked pretty good in that the analysis didn't highlight or find any pre-trends at all. Um, and so I was trying to figure out whether I had completely messed up the initial analysis. Uh, and so I started to estimate more robust models to test different outcome variables, to collect more data. Um, but this only made the problem worse uh, because not only we couldn't get rid of these pre-trends, we also found that apparently similar outcome variables, so just slightly different ways of defining mobility, yielded completely opposite conclusions. Basically, we found that in many cases, uh, the standard approach uh, used by economists, so the difference in differences, would lead the researcher to conclude that uh, the policies were actually increasing mobility which doesn't make uh, a ton of sense uh, and raises concerns. And so to conclude, um, uh, we draw two conclusions from the exercise. The first is that the standard difference in difference methods that we use fail to deliver credible estimates of the impacts of uh, COVID policies because the assumptions underlying these methods uh, do not hold uh, in the context of COVID. And our, our second conclusion is that Publication bias is hiding many of these issues. And we cannot say whether this bias comes from the fact that some models um, were uh, simply not considered by the researchers, or whether some results were not reported, or whether they were submitted but never published by journal editors. However, this suggests that uh, the evidence regarding the impact of mobility reducing measures is weaker than we previously thought, or at least within the applied economics literature that uses this method. And I think I'm getting a bit of our time, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Joe, that was fantastic. Um, and then finally, we'll hear from our third panelist. Um, so uh, Carrie Wallenitz is director of the Office of Science Policy at the National Institutes of Health and co-led the development of NIH's new policy for data management and sharing. Um, she's also worked extensively on biomedical research policy, and we're uh, just delighted that she was able to join us today and um, share her perspectives on this crucial issue. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Maya, and I'm really delighted to join you here today. And, and thanks so much for the organizers for really putting together such a timely and important conversation, um, because I think the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted the importance of um, open and timely data sharing and this intersection of, of transparency and public health, as you've heard from the previous speakers, as you'll be talking about throughout the, the course of the day. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion as an opportunity to dive deep into some of these um, opportunities and, and challenges. Um, so let me start, though, uh, just uh, by way of opening remarks at sort of the 30,000 foot view, because of course NIH is a, a publicly funded research funding agency. And so when we think about um, this intersection, we think about how can we use the carrots and sticks model of, um, of uh, research funding to really encourage and promote data sharing and, and open science and, and transparency. Um, we have been uh, uh, invested in this for a long time, of course. We have a lot of um, policies, whether it's genomic data, 
data sharing or, or clinical trials results sharing uh, to try to promote um, uh, open science and, and data sharing. And, and coincidentally, as the pandemic hit, um, we were uh, in the final stages of broadening our data sharing expectations by finalizing uh, a new data management and sharing policy, which has recently been released to really um, try to move the envelope forward um, even further in this space. Um, as the person who receives uh, all of the stakeholder input on this topic, um, I can tell you I hear both from folks who think we are not moving fast uh, enough or aggressively enough, as well as those who think um, we're going to break the system by moving too quickly. And those come down about 50-50, which gives me hope that perhaps we've gotten this right. <laughs> by and large. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, certainly everything we've seen with COVID-19 um, has really highlighted um, uh, some of the places where um, we were able to accelerate some things that we had already been thinking about, as well as accelerating and bringing into sharper focus some of the challenges um, uh, in this space. Um, you know, just to name a, a few of the things that NIH has been involved in, we've been encouraging um, uh, rapid access to clinical trials uh, data and results. Um, we've been trying to um, make publications uh, related to COVID-19 findable and accessible through uh, some of the work of our National Library of Medicine, um, really supporting the use of common data elements to, to make um, uh, some of these data sets uh, more interoperable. Um, and, uh, and then we We've also encountered um, some of the challenges, whether those are um, challenges of trying to bring people together quickly um, who maybe aren't used to working together. Um, we were able to stand up some very rapid public-private partnerships in this space, such as ACTIVE, um, uh, which um, uh, involves a lot of different health agencies and, and uh, private organizations, um, but getting everybody to sing from the same songbook, especially when it comes to uh, data sharing and, and infrastructure and, and, you know, all of those agreements. Um, I won't pretend that's been easy. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, some of the, the privacy challenges, I think, have been um, highlighted here. Uh, and so uh, I know we're going to be diving deeper into that, into the panel discussion, so I won't say uh, uh, more now, um, but I think there is a lot of uh, uh, interesting um, uh, substance to talk about and really looking forward to uh, uh, discussing it with the, the panelists going forward. So thanks again for the opportunity and look forward to the discussion. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Carrie and everyone. So let's just dive right in then. Um, so uh, I'd love to, to hear from you first, Samir, and then the other panelists. Um, Let's talk first about some of the successes of open science practices during the pandemic um, and, and how they've made a difference to the response. So um, you brought up one briefly that, that um, you've been involved in the code share, for example, but I'd love to hear more about that and more, more about other areas where you think we really have made some progress um, and also whether you think that that progress will be carried over to the post-pandemic era. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been working in infectious diseases for um, a decade now. It first started in 2009 with the with the swine flu pandemic. And it's very different, very, very different. I mean, just just to take it through a series of vignettes, as an example, um, when one wanted to start doing analysis on COVID-19 data, um, most of it was available, freely available through the ECDC, even with a nice R link to download it directly to um, whatever version of R you're using. And this is absolutely fantastic because, you know, back when, you know, Imperial College, we've been doing these, these, these uh, we're not, we used to be an outbreak center and now, now we do global health, but we've been doing these uh, responses to epidemics and pandemics for decades now. It's always been difficult to get hold of data to, to eventually, you know, do some analysis. And, you know, the data was so easy to access online that essentially you have, and I don't like using the term because it's derogatory, but you have a lot of the sort of armchair epidemiologists. You have a lot of people who, who ended up using this data to do really interesting work. You could draw intelligent, brilliant people from other fields into epidemiology and bring their knowledge in there. And so this was one vignette of a great, great resource. And I think, you know, the ECDC, the European Center for Disease, um, should be commended for this. Another one which was already brought up was of course Google Mobility. Now, 
if you've been working in infectious diseases for a long time, you realize that we've been begging social media giants for mobility data for decades now, just decades. Because you know, we always know that that's something like Apple, Apple Maps would have um, all the information about where people are moving and without a doubt, differential privacy could be maintained while sharing that data to researchers, but never really materialized. And it has now um, with Google Mobility. And we, you know, we have a paper that's currently under review where we work with a wonderful partner, Imodo from Sony Ericsson um, in collaboration with them. So we, 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 we've done, this, this data is another example of freely available data in, in the mix. Then of course, there are university type um, initiatives like the University of Oxford, the, the Vatnet School for Governance, uh, released something called the OXCGRT. It was a tracker of interventions. And it made it very easy for researchers or even just individuals to see what interventions had been implemented in which countries and try to try to sort of understand this pandemic for themselves and allow our researchers to really access it. And then finally, it's the it's the tools being released um, in that, you know, I'm a big exponent of the, the STAN framework because I, I'm, I'm a sort of Bayesian statistician at heart, but that's not just because I'm Bayesian, it's because STAN works. It's one of the few Bayesian software that just works perfectly and you can tell when it doesn't work. Now, you know, STAN, obviously we haven't done much <laughs> compared to what the STAN development team have done and should be commended for, but, you know, they've developed these amazing tools like our STAN arm and other platforms to use in statistical science. And now during this pandemic, we've ported our epidemiological tools into STAN and developed a package. For <laughs> and this kind of package we used, for example, to, 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 to sort of um, used in low and middle income settings um, with, with different researchers to, to really you know, allow and empower people who aren't sort of experts in this yet, but, could be, but need to make value in their country with their data to empower them. And so I think this is a really nice big trend in open science. These big platforms that like Stan, which I think should be supported more by funders and then researchers investing in that platform. So they're not developing bespoke shoddy R programs, but building off a nice template with well-established norms. And now that then becomes a very, very usable tool for researchers in different countries. So these are vignettes, which I could just go on and on um, in, in terms of this pandemic um, bringing about this. And, and they are fantastic. Um, whether they will stay, I mean, you know, only fools really predict the future. I, I hope they will. Um, perhaps it took an event of this magnitude to bring scientists together. Uh, I don't personally know whether these will remain. I hope they do. And, and I hope the aspects that help low and middle income country settings uh, especially will remain. Thanks so much for that, Samir. Um, so Joe, any, any thoughts to add to that? I mean, you had also mentioned kind of the success or progress in the private sector really in terms of data sharing. Um, you wanna speak more to that or other aspects of success and whether you think we can carry them through post this pandemic? Yeah, so yeah, maybe to add to what Samir was talking about on the private company side, yeah, and I, I think that the sharing of data at sometimes a, a pretty great level um, of precision ha has been amazing. And uh, oftentimes when there is some, for, before the pandemic, there was not a lot of data shared by uh, some of these companies like Samir mentioned, but when it was shared, it was always fairly aggregated data and a bit of a black box where we don't know how the data was created, what were the choices made uh, behind the hood or under the hood. Um, but for the case of uh, like some of these mobility data, and uh, again, I'm taking the, you know, the example of SafeGraph because I, I know it better than the others. Like the company was really involved in the process with the researchers, even after sharing the data, they, they kept uh, working with us uh, to understand how the data was created. Sometimes uh, we told them that we realized there were some issues in the data or some inaccuracies and they would work on the data on, on their hand and send us uh, an updated version. So it was really a, a back and forth, um, which uh, frankly was, uh, was pretty amazing. And um, I, I think they, they should be celebrated for that. Um, 
On, on the citizen side, uh, there has been a lot of crowdsourcing to, to uh, consolidate very large data sets of government interventions that occurred around the world. And again, these, um, these were data that, that were publicly available. You could like uh, data mine the, the ministries of health uh, in France, or in, uh, in Sierra Leone or New Zealand to figure out what policies they were implementing. But it, it, it takes a lot of time to do. And uh, I think the fact that some people spontaneously came together to uh, share the burden and to create these data sets was super helpful. Um, and so uh, this generated a lot of research in a, in a very short time frame, uh, and it was also published fairly quickly in special issues journals um, in economics. In, in economics, the, the process can, can take a very long time, either six months to several years. So it was really helpful to have special issues or even in some cases entirely new journals uh, to be able to disseminate this research. Um, Finally, as to whether this progress will be uh, sustained post pandemic, I, I really don't know, but I, I think we can already take some steps to try to ensure that it will, because there will clearly be other pandemics and it, it would help a lot if before the next pandemic hits, uh, there could be already collaborations in place between uh, public health agencies and uh, companies that own data that would be of great value to uh, epidemiologists or uh, applied scientists in general. Wonderful, thank you. And then finally, um, Carrie, you know, you, obviously the NIH has been leading progress in this area for quite a while pre-pandemic and that has continued and accelerated during the pandemic. I'd love to just hear you expand more in this area. What do you think some of these successes have been or areas of particular progress and, and what we're gonna see um, as we, bridge to the next stage of epidemic control with the vaccine coming up. Yeah, just to underscore something the previous panelists both alluded to, I, I think perhaps the most important um, immediate change we've seen is that pre-pandemic, as we tried to um, increase access to data and, and expand our ability to share data, um, you were often confronted with the 552 reasons why this wouldn't work, this can't work, all of the all of the challenges. I I think that was all wiped away um, in the response to the pandemic, in that there was this sense through all of the stakeholders of the enterprise, of course, of course, we need to remove these barriers, of course, we need to share data, of course, we need to remove some of these barriers um, in the interests of, of public health. And so there was this real ethos of, yes, we need to figure this out and, and share data broadly and create these um, systems and, and structures. And I think um, some of the specific successes I would point to that NIH has been involved, I um, mentioned the, the active partnership, the uh, accelerating COVID um, therapeutics and interventions and vaccines, um, which involves uh, both public and private sector, um, in which we've seen things like a commitment to put together a shared database for preclinical data um, that, is, that is open and includes not just the data, but information about how the data were generated um, and, and is establishing an infrastructure that I, I hope will continue well beyond um, the pandemic and, and really serve as a, a model for the future. Um, on the clinical side, certainly the national COVID cohort collaboration, the NC3 um, uh, data resource um, is an example of something that was put together very quickly uh, to help facilitate this sort of open exchange. And and I, you know, I, I think that um, sometimes it's the first step that feels like a doozy when you have these sorts of cultural changes. And the fact that so many um, players, whether those are individual scientists or companies or public health agencies who were hesitant to really push the envelope have had to plunge into the deep end very quickly in order to ensure pandemic response. Suddenly they've realized, wow, 
wow, maybe this wasn't quite as hard as I thought it was going to be. And I think once you've once you've um, torn that curtain away, there is there is no going back. And so I am optimistic that we will see um, long term positive um, impact and, and removal of some of these barriers going forward because um, people have have moved forward into the breach and uh, have have recognized that this is possible. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think we're going to be able to um, uh, to pull that back, which is which is a good thing. Fantastic, thanks. So, so maybe that's a that's a nice way to segue to the next question, which we've heard a lot of the, about a, the, a lot of the progress. But um, I'd also really love to hear from the panelists about areas where we've fallen short and what you think some of the biggest barriers are uh, that remain. And um, maybe as part of that, um, do you think some of those barriers are legitimate? Do you think there are uh, you know, they're just things we need to overcome. Or are there really some intractable challenges here or risks of moving towards open data practices? So maybe for that, I'll just uh, stick with you, Carrie, first of all. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, well, again, I think uh, much like the opportunities, the challenges aren't necessarily new, but they've been brought into sharper focus by the need to address them in a very quick and, and rapid fashion without a whole lot of time for deliberative, thoughtful um, uh, discussion. Uh, certainly some of the things we think about is um, this balance between maximizing data access while protecting participant privacy, I think has been brought into sharper focus. Um, it, you know, I think the demands, um, which is entirely understandable for COVID-19 data that is really uh, maximally utilizable, um, extends to what you know in in other circumstances we might include um, identifiers that that are potentially problematic from a participant privacy point of view um, and that is running headlong into uh, not just real world policy challenges but also I think sometimes the risk averse nature of you know the entire enterprise which has a lot of variability grow uh, you know um, uh, globally but but also I think you know there's this automatic reaction of like, well, we can't do that, you know, that's going to be a, a privacy violation, which is clashing in a very real way with those who are folks, but we have to do this because we're in the middle of an emergency. Um, and that's really hard to solve on the, the fly. And I think we're going to be thinking through the long term consequences of that for, for quite some time. I also think um, that we are uh, uh, confronting some of the previously existing challenges of it's all very well to say that um, uh, you know we need to maximize um, findability and interoperability and and comparability of, of various data sets and data resources. Um, uh, but those are not easy uh, challenges to overcome overnight. And so while we are able to build on some of the previous work and previous discussions, there are still a fair a number of um, significant challenges that uh, I think are uh, remain and are coming up um, uh, in the forefront. I also think, um, I, you know, we, and, and this is not my area of expertise, but I know we have a lot of experts uh, uh, participating today, you know, infrastructure um, is not something that magically appears, you know, through the use of, of you know, database gnomes overnight. Um, and, and so instead, what we've seen is a lot of repurposing of existing infrastructure in an effort to be able to move quite rapidly. Um, and I think, what we've seen is sometimes that has worked well and sometimes it hasn't. And so um, I, I think it remains a, a challenge of how do we in real time um, uh, maximally use existing infrastructures while also laying the foundation for where we want to go in the future. Because of course, we're still right in the middle of the pandemic, even though um, truthfully, it feels like this has been going on. <laughs> <laughs> for a really long time. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's simultaneously trying to reconfigure what we've got at the present or, or retroactively while also recognizing um, we're still in the middle of it and need to lay the foundation for the, the future in terms of infrastructure. And um, that is a that is a considerable challenge. Thanks for that. And, and before I move on, maybe just a follow-up question. I mean, I think something you said that really struck home rung true is that the barrier, a lot of these barriers are this intersection of legal barriers um, around privacy, uh, 
legitimate sort of technological barriers in terms of how we handle data um, and also just sort of cultural or habit barriers. It's the, we can't do that because we've been trained for so long to say, we can't do that. It's, and, and you know, to err on the side of caution and be careful you don't get in trouble essentially. Um, how do you see us as a society navigating those? Where does the change come from? Is it, um, it's probably more than one place, but you know, what's the role for government and policies versus um, technological fixes versus really just working as a culture, including coming from an academic perspective to try to shift that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a balance of, um never waste a good crisis while also, you know, watch what, what you wish for, <laughs> I would say. I mean, you know, um, uh, it is, I think, really confronting these in a straightforward, common sense manner. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan in everyday life of, of not accepting the, you know, we can't do that. I think once you really start asking a lot of questions, in fact, you find that some of the barriers that are perceived as um, immutable are in fact really the result of sort of long-term practice or, or cultural uh, barriers. And you can work through those um uh with with commitments and and um uh an open mind uh entering into the uh entering into the conversation and um the ability to manage change um over whatever a, a particular time scale is um uh, but i also think you know the 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 other side of the spectrum that i've also um uh, noticed is um sometimes barriers exist for a reason and so a really good example that i've you know that i've seen playing out in the pandemic is in the regulatory space right so i think it's um uh, particularly true uh, sometimes in the the academic science world we we perceive regulations as barriers they're obstacles you know to be overcome they're the rules that get in the way um, and sometimes that's true uh, but also uh, recognizing that sometimes those rules serve a purpose in terms of safeguarding whether that is a safety standard or an ethical standard and so finding that balance of how do we push back against those perceived barriers um, uh, while also making sure we are bolstering the the real world guardrails um, uh, is is sort of a continuing challenge, honestly. And I do think it lends itself um, to really trying to, and this is easier than said than done in the midst of a pandemic, bringing all the relevant stakeholders into the room and saying, okay, you know, like we have to get from point A to point B, let's figure out how to build the bridge to get there um, and not be um, uh, hung up on, on some of these uh, perceived uh, uh, obstacles in the way. Great, thank thank you so much for that. Uh, Samir, maybe I'll, I'll go to you next then and, and love to hear your thoughts as well. Some of the areas, areas we really have fallen short and are facing barriers, what we can do about them and if some of them are, are legitimate. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of, as with always with the successes, there are an equal if not more number of failures. Um, but, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say you know, maybe the word failures is, is strong. <laughs> Things that need to be improved. A lot of these things that need to be improved actually um, arise in general because of problems in academia. Um, and so a couple of those examples would be the first one was, of course, that, um, you know, people who get data aren't rewarded in the right way in academic structures and academic incentives, right? You could spend 10 years generating a really amazing data set and then, you know, by what we are discussing here in open science, put that straight up on GitHub. Now somebody else can take that. Perhaps they are better tooled at something else and perhaps they have some new ideas and they can then get amazing outputs from that. <clears throat> and so the incentive structure for someone getting data out isn't there. And often, you know, the, these issues reflect, um, you know, the, the reason that open data safe practices aren't adopted as easily is reflecting the incentive structures within academic institutions, which is that they are not rewarding people who create data, people who make new data as they should. And as scientists, you know, we can hope to solve this in here, but really we need buy-in from funders and the universities themselves. 
and changing the academic. These are the kind of things that should be taken into account in tenure and taken into account in other applications. Um, that that's one, of course, the in terms of in terms of the failure. The second one is, of course, the, the difficulties that we have around uh, around peer review, um, which is you know people really do dismiss peer review and, and they, 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 they will go from one extreme to the other from saying that, you know, peer review is fundamentally flawed and all science is fundamentally wrong um, to comparing, but then, you know, comparing peer review to a tweet is not, is not the same thing in terms of messaging. And so, you know, when a pandemic comes around, um, it's of course completely fine and wanted to have differing opinions. But you know this should be done in a respectful scientific environment, um, in writing papers based on the evidence, refuting papers based on the evidence, preprints coming out a lot. Um, you know, you know, just speaking to to my my old colleague Ben. There's, there's um, you know, other things like open review and, and other other sort of um, means out there to sort of do faster review before doing the formalized peer review. They are in betweens that that. In, in a polarized sense, we, we tend to ignore that, yes, peer review has its problems, yes, peer review can be improved upon. There are other ways in between to sort of get science in the right state. Um, and then finally, one of the failures, it's not really a failure, but I think it's a niche job that should be more adopted, which is, you know, as somebody who, who sort of uh, had to sit, sit through quite a lot of the sort of hate mail and things during the early parts of the pandemic, you know, as my job as a scientist is to produce evidence to the best of my degree, and almost always all the papers I produce are remarkably uninteresting because they focus on a very, very, you, you know, nuanced bit and they don't answer the bigger sweeping questions. The jobs of policymakers and perhaps some job in between is to synthesize this data, to synthesize the scientific evidence, uh, and, and then develop a clear message on that. And so, you know, perhaps there should be more papers of this kind doing situations like this to sort of amalgamate different viewpoints and actually present evidence. And I think probably we can learn a lot from climate scientists uh, in terms of how they've, how they've got apart their messaging on this. Um, so, you know, these are all, I wouldn't say failures because it sounds like too negative a word. These are all things that, that we can now see much more clearly in the light of a global crisis that need to be improved incrementally, slowly without throwing out sort of all that we've achieved so far. Thanks for that. And, and before we move on to Joe, I just want to go back to another sort of point you touched on earlier, which is kind of the accessibility to armchair epidemiologists that more open science practices have provided and how, you know, you mentioned how that really could be a great thing because you bring in smart people from all sorts of disciplines who can contribute to the conversation. Um, do you see risks or downsides of that as well? And, and if so, is there anything we can do to kind of uh, get the good parts of this um, opening up of the field while uh, mitigating the risks? I think, I think in general, it's mainly just good parts, to be honest, right? I mean, from a personal story, I am, uh, I'm arguably an armchair epidemiologist myself. But um, I, you know, starting this, this pandemic, um, you know, reached out to some of my colleagues in the mathematics department at Imperial, you know, one of whom I've never actually met physically, but we've, we've, we've been interacting for many months now. You know, they'd been working in economics or social media and sort of brought them in, brought the expertise in, and then just started a collaboration that was eventually fruitful and that we all learned from and produced good output. We shared our, our work, we shared our group, and we did it all together. And so this was a really, really nice um, sort of bit of moving it in together. So there aren't that many negatives if, if these sort of this work is done in a respectful way through the academic route with the goal of producing good science and all these lofty conclusions. I mean, you know, the, 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 the derogatory term armchair epidemiologist just refers to people who fit some line in Excel and then make sweeping claims without having paid any due diligence to the thousands of, 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 of hours put in before and the papers out there without reading any of them. Exactly. If someone comes in from a different field, reads the papers, understands the field, understands the nuances and contributes, that can only be a beautiful and wonderful thing. But it has to be done in, in, a, in a respectful and, and you know, 
acknowledging that there are smart people in all fields who have done work and let's build on that rather than just this 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 fury that that this pandemic has 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 fooled, which is understandable, I guess, but you know, it's something that we can learn from. Yeah, absolutely. And that sort of ties into your point as well about the difference between a peer review and a tweet um, in terms of that contributing to that kind of uh, uh, thoughtful, respectful vetting. Um, so, so maybe with that, with Joe, I'd love to, to go to you and hear your thoughts on this as well. Um, really any thoughts? Um, one in particular, I haven't heard as much about is um, sort of equivalent concerns over code sharing. So one thing I've heard in discussions with some colleagues is, you know, it's a career that goes into building a complex mathematical model. And um, I think two concerns I've heard is you, if you post the code, one, that is your career. So similar to kind of the data concerns that Samir was raising. Um, second, uh, that, uh, that it might be misused and misinterpreted. So, um, Curious your thoughts on that, are those legitimate? And really any thoughts on uh, just, just the barriers and, 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 uh, and risks and what we can do about them? I think that uh, at, at least in uh, my field of economics, sharing code uh, is not yet the norm, but uh, it feels like we are at least moving there and more and more people are putting all their code on, uh, on GitHub. Um, and it is costly to do that because, well, when other people are going to look at your code, you want to make sure that it's not uh, really ugly and garbage. So you have to work on the code before putting it online. But I think ultimately this promotes good uh, coding practices. Um, and maybe more specific to the issues I mentioned earlier about publication bias, uh, one area where we, we might have fallen short is that uh, with the pandemic, there was not really any change to the standard practice of um, writing and publishing a unified story with robustness checks and alternative models that basically all agree uh, with each other and, and show the same results. Um, and I think this may have contributed to give a misguided sense uh, of our understanding and of the relevance of certain models that we use, especially for economists, because uh, um, I mean, epidemiologists have been working with epidemiological data for a long uh, time, but economists like me, we, we just saw an opportunity to apply some tools we had uh, and we, have, we applied them and maybe in some cases uh, we were not, uh, as careful as, uh, as we should have been. Um, and so people have been worried about publication bias for a long time and uh, some recommendations made by Edward Lehmer some 40 years ago is that researchers should declare all the different things that they tried in a project, uh, not just the ones that worked. And this is a great recommendation, but it hasn't uh, really become the standard in the past decades. And it's also pretty hard to enforce. Um, so one way to improve on that is that maybe instead of trying to preserve uh, the narrative consistency of a paper, it would be great for, for journals to find a way to incentivize the identification of uncertainty around our empirical results. Basically, um, instead of having an appendix showing many robustness tables that do not cast any doubt on the main results of the paper, perhaps we should instead be asking, what would it take to break the main empirical conclusions of the paper? What would it take to break the results? Is it a change in the sample used, a change in the model? And if so, how large does this change have to be? Um, and so, I mean, observational studies are, are really messy. So it's al almost always possible to break down the results and sometimes it doesn't take much. So to me, it is a bit mind boggling that Almost all the robustness checks in published papers show that results hold under a huge kind of uh, different specifications. But the current incentives do not promote uh, to do something different. Um, so I think this is relevant for applied uh, social science in general, but maybe even more so in pandemic response, where figuring out quickly what we don't really know for sure is uh, especially valuable. And uh, in, in that regard, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic because there has been uh, really some progress in this direction in recent years, both uh, applied and methodological. And for instance, there is uh, Rachel Meager and some of her co-authors, they, they have a new paper where they suggest to rerun analysis with 1% of the data deleted at random to see if the results still hold when you do that. And 
I think if this type of uh, techniques becomes more applied, this could uh, add a lot of credibility to the findings. Um, and I think that Francesca Parente will also present some work discussing uh, multiple specifications and what we can learn from that uh, later today. Fantastic. Um, so I think we've got about 12 minutes left. So I would love to leave some time for uh, participants in the audience to uh, 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 join in with questions. So feel free to either type your chat into the um, chat box or you can raise your hand and uh, Katie will call on you. Let's Have any participant questions? Um, while we're waiting, while you think about questions, um, uh, let's go around to our panelists. And um, why don't you tell me um, if you could do one concrete, if you could nominate one concrete step that we could take now that will either help us get through the end of this pandemic, as Carrie said, we're still in the midst, um, or prepare for uh, the next one, what would it be? Um, so uh, maybe I'll start with you, Joe. Um, I mean, if, if, if I could help uh, or like if, if I could choose anything I want, I think I would facilitate uh, future collaborations between private companies and uh, public agencies. And again, I, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, hurdles to doing that and regulatory constraints and uh, Terry mentioned some of them, but I'm, I'm sure there are many more that I'm uh, ignoring. But I, I think we, we, we can try to be proactive and uh, establish these collaborations beforehand so that when uh, we need to have access to high quality uh, proprietary data in the future, we already have all the differential privacy settings that we want to make this data more widely available. Great, thank you. Uh, Samir, what's your, what's your top concrete step? Uh, I think, you know, speaking from uh, my my, my sort of usual job of working on malaria and other other diseases it is to empower and to and to to create infrastructure in low and middle income settings for um for researchers to contribute substantially to um tackling disease in their countries uh, i think it's it's really important um the only thing probably more important than that in, in preventing the next pandemic is tackling climate change Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and Carrie, what's your uh, what's your top step? Well, I think to echo Samir, um, there are a lot of resources flowing right now related to the pandemic, and I would really um, hope that we can all think about how some of those resources could be utilized to build in a durable way the sort of flexible, adaptable data infrastructure um, uh, in in a variety of settings that will be useful not just for the current situation, but will endure uh, beyond it. Um, so uh, infrastructure investments are never sexy, um, but they're incredibly important. And I, I think um, we should really take advantage of this opportunity. I just want to, I'm moderating, but in my researcher and uh, uh, policy support hat, I would just like to strongly reiterate that as a, as a top step as well. I think we've really seen the places our infrastructure falls short and the huge potential to do better with better infrastructure. Um, and it's hard to build the plane while you're flying it. So um, great. So we have a couple questions in the chat here. Um, uh, one regards uh, complete open databases available. Open sources are with missing data or rather incomplete. Um, so, uh, not not to, to kind of think about that. I'd love to hear the camp uh, the panelists' perspective on the um, best open data sources. And of course, some of that incompleteness is inherent to our measurement structure in the field, right? I mean, there's a lot of incompleteness that is just the nature of the pandemic. But of course, there are other levels that can come in as well. So, uh, thoughts on open data sources? Let's see. Anybody I mean, want to jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Samir. Yeah, I mean, I. I I think, you know, unfortunately, just with epidemiological data, it's never complete, ever. Um, it's just, you know, you, you compare it to looking at sort of Twitter and looking at cascades of influence on Twitter, you know, you've got complete thorough data on the same notes. And infectious diseases happens once a bunch of people get infected and that's all you have. 
you, you miss lots of people. And even if you do the best you can, like in South Korea and other places with, with amazing surveillance, you miss. So unfortunately, you know, I think it's best to just have the data out there. And I think perhaps what needs to be done is, is a criteria by which to explain the limitations of the data, some sort of um, protocol developed by smart people with lots of thought. I, I love that because I do think if that does seem to me one of the risks of, um, I should stop using the term, I don't mean it derogatorily, but armchair epidemiology, where you're not necessarily familiar with the fact that, um, I think now we all know, for example, that case data might massively underrepresent infections, but you know, just as a simple example, all the limitations of the data. So I think that like a sort of an open source that really makes that clear and is more uniform across settings sounds amazing. Um, Carrie or Joe, do you want to comment on this question? Um, yes, maybe just on the open data uh, and what you just mentioned, Maya, regarding uh, the underestimation of the, uh, uh, of the cases. Um, I, I think it's just last month that uh, open data became available for testing uh, at the county level. And I mean, this is super important uh, to, in, to include in, in models because if we only have case data, then we are uh, overweighting uh, areas that do a lot of testing or areas that are better at testing. And because we don't know what these areas are there, we cannot reverse engineer uh, this bias that, that we introduce. Um, so now, now this data is made available uh, by the CDC and, and hopefully if, if needed in the future, uh, testing data will, will become available earlier as well. And you've, you've got a hand up. Um, there's, a, there's another question in the chat and then there's also someone with their hand up. So if- um... uh, Could you call in the person with their hand up? Yeah, so? sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's see. Mel Kamu, I think you can you can unmute and, and ask your question. Hmm. I think uh, we're, on, we're not able to hear you very well. Um, maybe go ahead and type it into the chat. I think that might work. Yeah, better. that might be better. No Sorry freedom. about that. Type your questions into the chat. I think that'll probably be smoother. Um, in, the, in the meantime, if I may, there's one question there, which is how do you, how reliable is prediction with inc incomplete data? Uh, I would recommend everybody reads um, Michael Bettencourt's uh, from Stan um, <clears throat> a work of reproducible work Bayesian workflow. Uh, it's one of those things. It's you know how reliable is prediction with incomplete data? Is an army of statistical tests that need to be done. And it is possible for you to sort of assess reliability of your models, but it takes a huge amount of effort. So, you know, I recommend sort of, you know, looking at Stan's Bayesian workflow as a nice holistic way to, to assess how reliable your model is and how compatible it is with the data, what you know, what you don't know. And I might just add to that editorially that also contextual information um, is something you cannot do without. Um, to speak to even if you know who is tested and not just the cases, understanding what goes into allowing different groups to access testing differentially, for example, is, uh, is, is super important. So um, we have a question, how are we doing on time? Oh, we have about three minutes. Um, question on privacy in the US and China. What do we, what do we know exactly um, about data uh, differences in the data between the two uh, contexts. You would want to speak to that. That was actually an area I'd love to hear more about. We have to keep it fairly brief, but um, international differences in a data context or data availability. I mean, I, can, I, I don't want to keep monopolizing it, but I'll just say quickly and then let the other panelists go or the other panelists just interrupt me at any point because I remember. <laughs> So quick, quickly, briefly, I mean, they're very different, right, in terms of the reporting. The U.S. data was very hard to get hold of. We, early on at Imperial College, did quite a lot of U.S. modeling um, and, you know, sounded the alarm for the, the rising uh, reproduction number around June and July with some of the work. It was very hard to get, actually, you know, the data from the U.S. So I think, you know, the U.S. and China were, were definitely, neither of them were sort of pioneers in this field compared to other countries that had better data. We found much better data in Brazil than from the US, for example, at that time. Um, very difficult, yeah. 
Uh, any concluding thoughts? We're almost at, uh, at time. So concluding thoughts, either on international data access or really just um, points that you'd like, uh, like to leave us with from the other two panelists. Maya, I think there's a, a comment in the chat that I wanted to um, just yeah. address briefly and by way of a closing thought, which is about incentives, right? So I think, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, there's this sense of, you know, you need to do this for altruistic reasons, right? We're, we're in an emergency, you know, um, uh, it's not the time to look for a sort of personal gain. Um, and, and while that may be true, I do think, however, it, it shines a bright focus on the um, incompatibility of the incentive system, particularly in academic and, and public funding with um, the motivations of, of building infrastructure, of, of sharing data, of, of being a good sort of citizen scientist in, in a lot of this uh, sense. And so this again is an opportunity for us to re-examine and think, how do we move the culture towards incentivizing the kinds of behaviors that, that um, we want to see in this space. I mean, this is, I, I have to say, this is my whole world, right? Like at the end of the day, policy is all about uh, human behavior change <laughs> and, and how do we use those incentives um, or disincentives as the case may be uh, to, to see the behavior that we wanna see. But I think um, the, the pandemic has put a sharp point and, and while people are, you know, sort of throwing off the personal gain um, uh, uh, chains in a lot of way and, and doing things for really um, uh, public good oriented uh, altruistic reasons. Um, we also maybe need to start thinking about how do we retroactively recognize um, uh, those uh, steps forward and then and then use that as a platform to reinvigorate our, our discussion of how to better align our incentives and disincentives with the kinds of behaviors we want to see in this this arena. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so Joe, we're at time, but I just wanna give you a chance, any concluding thoughts or words to leave us with before we move to the breakout rooms? I mean, I, I completely agree with what uh, Kerry uh, just said. And I think that getting the incentives right is super important. We can, uh, we can hope that uh, people will uh, apply good practices on their own, but maybe we should not just rely on that. Um, just because, I, I view transparency a bit as uh, uh, environmental sustainability in that if we want people to reduce their carbon footprints, then we can hope that they will take the plane a bit less, that they will uh, eat a bit less meat, etc. But there are more efficient ways to uh, promote sustainability that are, do not entirely put this burden on individual decisions. Mm -hmm. So getting the incentive structures uh, right, I, I think is uh, incredibly important. Fantastic. Well, I just want to conclude by thanking this uh, incredible panel. It's been an honor to moderate and talk with you all today. And thank you also to the audience.